I granted permission, so it should be going. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. Sociologist Andrew Greeley writes that Catholics live in an enchanted world. In his book, The Catholic Imagination, Greeley presents multiple survey findings that indicate Catholics possess a unique worldview. They see metaphors for the transcendent in ordinary matter, and they grasp the meaning of suffering. The writings of J.R.R. Tolkien and Oscar Wilde abound with evidence for such a worldview. To deem Tolkien's worldview Catholic will hardly raise eyebrows, but to so name Wilde's worldview may be a literary heresy. Homosexual hedonist that he was, how could Wilde have seen life from the standpoint of a religion with a 2000 year reputation for dogmatically defying the type of lifestyle that Wilde enjoyed? But if one looks past the glitz and glamor of Wilde's biography, one discovers the tragic tale of a soul caught between heaven and hell. Wilde's relationship with the church, a continuous ebb and flow. His mother's admiration of Irish nationalists led her to baptize Oscar as a young boy, and Wilde was later educated at Oxford during the height of a Catholic resurgence in England known as the Oxford Movement. As a young man, Wilde's art displayed a striking admiration for Catholicism, not merely for its aesthetic value, but even in his open support of such controversial figures as Pope Pius IX and Cardinal Manning. Wilde journeyed to Rome, communicated with local priests about conversion through much of his life, and was eventually converted on his deathbed. Still, the aim of this paper is not biography, but an examination of two writers' works for evidence of a particular worldview. Wilde need not have been a practicing Catholic to have had a Catholic imagination. As Greeley maintains, and I quote, to see God in creation through Catholic eyes, it is not necessary to be a good Catholic, whatever that is, end quote. J.R.R. Tolkien was a good Catholic. His mother believed so strongly in the faith that she converted despite the wrath of her family, who subsequently disowned her. Tolkien never wavered in his faith, was raised by a Catholic priest after his mother's death, and attended mass regularly at St. Aloysius' Catholic Church in Oxford. On the surface, the attitudes and outlook of these two British authors could not be more different. Humphrey Carpenter, Tolkien's biographer, even describes Tolkien's plain masculine clothing style as a reaction to the excessive dandyism and implied homosexuality of the aesthetes, Wilde's milieu. So what then, besides a proclivity for writing characters with a strong fondness for tobacco, does Tolkien's imagination have in common with Wilde's? Well, I believe that when taken together, the writings of Wilde and Tolkien shed light on one another, each writer voicing what the other strove to express, so that it may be truly said that Tolkien was the greatest student Wilde never had. Though both men varied in the degree of their involvement with the church, the writings of Wilde and Tolkien exhibit a Catholic way of seeing the world. Shared beliefs about the purpose of art underpin the writings of Wilde and Tolkien. Wilde's preface to The Picture of Dorian Gray famously asserts that all art is quite useless, a very terse summarization of the critical stance that Wilde elaborates in longer works, such as The Critic as Artist and The Decay of Lying. Wilde opposes those who seek to reduce works of art to simplistic didactic tools. Art never expresses anything but itself, Wilde asserts. Tolkien's statements about art's inherent value complement Wilde's critical stance. Wilde's theories in the preface to the revised edition of Dorian Gray harmonize well with Tolkien's aesthetic philosophy as glimpsed in the foreword to the second edition of The Lord of the Rings. There, Tolkien addresses the many opinions or guesses as to the motives and meaning of the tale. As for any inner meaning or message it has in the intention of the author, none. It is neither allegorical nor topical, Tolkien writes in response to those reviewers who sought to reduce his work to a thinly veiled allegory for World War II. But as any serious Tolkien scholar will know, The Lord of the Rings was begun well before the outbreak of the Second World War. Later in his foreword, Tolkien writes, quote, I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations, and always have done so since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence. I much prefer history, true or feigned, with its varied applicability to the thought and experience of readers. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory. But the one resides in the freedom of the reader and the other in the purposed domination of the author, end quote. 
Tolkien shares Wilde's belief that the meaning of any beautiful created thing is at least as much in the soul of him who looks at it as it was in his soul who wrought it. There is more freedom in applicability, where the reader is free to deduce an infinite number of meanings from a work of art. And the applicability of Tolkien's work certainly attests to its long-lasting popularity among new generations that find new meaning in his work. Additionally, Tolkien's preference for history, true or feigned, becomes pregnant with meaning in light of Wilde's famous essay, The Decay of Lying, where the lying prescribed by Wilde is virtually another term for imagination or imaginer. In this sense, Wilde's liar corresponds to Tolkien's term sub-creator. Both Wilde and Tolkien discouraged reductive interpretations of their art and never intended their work to have a one-dimensional message or use. While their aesthetic views are compatible, the work of both authors reveals a more Catholic understanding of creation and matter itself. Greeley highlights sacramentality as a characteristic of the Catholic imagination, an attribute found frequently in the writings of Wilde and Tolkien. Sacramentality describes how Catholics see created reality as a sacrament, that is, a revelation of the presence of God. The Catholic worldview sees magic in matter because it was spoken into existence, almost spell-like by God. In other words, the Catholic imagination loves metaphors, and Catholics stress the like of any comparison, as opposed to a more Protestant worldview, which stresses the unlike between matter and God, or the materialist worldview, which sees no God at all, and matter as mere molecules. In Wilde's work, the simple matter that we take for granted is imbued with metaphoric meaning through transformation and transubstantiation. This theme of matter transformed courses through much of Wilde's writings, especially in his fairy tales. In one of these tales, The Young King, the eponymous hero's rough sheepskin coat, rude shepherd's staff, and circlet of wild briar are symbols of Christ-like humility, those seen by his materialist community as symbols of shame, scorn, and low status. Later in the story, the sheepskin, rude staff, and briar crown are transformed after the hero climbs up the steps of the altar and stands before the image of Christ. At the altar, matter is transubstantiated as, quote, sunbeams wove round the king a tissued robe that was fairer than the robe that had been fashioned for his pleasure. The dead staff blossomed and bare lilies that were whiter than pearls. The dry thorn blossomed and bare roses that were redder than rubies. Whiter than fine pearls were the lilies and their stems were of bright silver. Redder than male rubies were the roses and their leaves were of beaten gold, end quote. The transubstantiation of the young king's attire at the altar is most obviously drawn from the Catholic mass, particularly the ritual whereby the priest sanctifies plain bread and wine, transforming them into the body and blood of Jesus. It is no accident that this transformation occurs at an altar. This Catholic tendency to emphasize the metaphorical nature of creation finds expression in Tolkien's work as well. In his essay on fairy stories, Tolkien writes, quote, fairy contains many things besides elves and fays, and besides dwarfs, witches, trolls, giants, or dragons. It holds the seas, the sun, the moon, the sky, and the earth, and all things that are in it, tree and bird, water and stone, wine and bread, and ourselves, mortal men, when we are enchanted, end quote. Tolkien's creative writing displays a similar knack for elevating matter through our experience of reading, what he calls recovery. For Tolkien, our experience with art, specifically fairy tales and mythopoetic literature, helps humanity in regaining a clear view of the created world, so that things seen clearly may be freed from the drab blur of triteness or familiarity. We should meet the centaur and the dragon, writes Tolkien, and then perhaps suddenly behold, like the ancient shepherds, sheep and dogs and horses and wolves, end quote. After an experience with art, particularly mythic literature, one views the world differently. Like Tolkien, or like Wilde rather, Tolkien masterfully transubstantiates bread and wine into the Lembus and Miravore of the elves, which have the power of nourishing more than ordinary bread and wine. According to Tolkien's theory, our encounter with Lembus and Miravore provides a deeper appreciation of bread and wine the next time we encounter them in ordinary life. Tolkien also fashions Lembus and Miravore to suggest the Catholic Eucharist, where bread and wine are imbued with not just metaphoric value, but also with substantive value. Thus, in the writings of Wilde and Tolkien, matter is saturated with divine significance. <laughs>
Greeley ends his study with an analysis of the Catholic belief in salvation through sadness and the sacrament of hope, themes I find prominent in the writings of both authors. In his famous letter from prison, De Profundis, Wilde writes, quote, suffering is the only means by which we become conscious of existing, end quote. In true Catholic fashion, nothing is without meaning, suffering least of all. Suffering is a revelation, and Wilde feels that the purpose of his letter is to teach Lord Alfred Douglas, and by extension all of us, the meaning of sorrow and its beauty. But I believe Wilde's art reflected this deeper understanding of the meaning of sorrow long before his imprisonment. The old and evil-visaged man in The Star Child, another of Wilde's fairy tales, who enslaves the hero and abuses him is the instrument through which the hero receives his humanity and his redemption. Similarly, the shallow aestheticism that Dorian Gray inherits from Henry Wotton, the kind that ignores life's sores, is painted as corrupting and harmful to Dorian. Even before he penned De Profundis, Wilde's art displays an understanding that suffering, more than pleasure, provides meaning. Tolkien coined the phrase eucatastrophe, implying the sudden change from bad to good to describe the happy endings essential to all fairy tales. But while arguing for a happy ending, Tolkien stresses that the eucatastrophe does not deny the existence of discatastrophe, of sorrow and failure, for, quote, the possibility of these is necessary to the joy of deliverance. The eucatastrophe denies universal final defeat and insofar as evangelium giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant as grief, end quote. Tolkien employs his own literary technique in the conclusion to The Lord of the Rings, where when all hope is lost and Gollum has taken the ring for himself, the creature gloats too wildly and plummets into Mount Doom, thus destroying the ring. And suffering is no light matter in Tolkien either. Frodo has been so deeply hurt that he cannot remain in the world even after victory and peace have been achieved. An equally keen awareness of the value of suffering runs through Wilde's fairy tales. In The Selfish Giant, the little boy's wounds that so incense the giant are the wounds of love, Christ's redemptive wounds. The swallow in The Happy Prince bestows a final kiss upon the statue of the prince before dying, taking joy in their sacrifices. And in The Nightingale and the Rose, who can remain unmoved by the selfless bird who gives up her very life for, quote, the love that is perfected by death, end quote. And the Nightingale's ignored sacrifice, I am reminded of the Hobbit's failure to acknowledge Frodo's sacrifice at the end of The Lord of the Rings. Frodo's companion Sam is, quote, pained to notice how little honor Frodo had in his own country. Few people knew or wanted to know about his deeds and adventures, end quote. In this, Wilde and Tolkien display their profound understanding of Jesus's passion. While Jesus appears in many of Wilde's writings, he finds his most, most Catholic expression in the letter De Profundis. There, Wilde describes Christ as the true artist, whose very life is a work of art incarnate, contact with him inspiring love and beauty and romance. Wilde, like Plato, understood that every work of art is a conversion of an idea into an image, and that some of these images are more real than others. The personhood of Christ is the ultimate actualization of an artistic ideal, the opening lines of the Gospel of John implying that the author spoke himself into reality. In fulfilling the dream of the Virgilian poet and the signs noted by Isaiah, Christ actualized all the mythic symbols of the Western world that preceded him. Wilde believed that an idea is of no value until it becomes incarnate and is made an image. So Christ made of himself the image of the man of sorrows, an archetype recurrent in myth. Through Jesus, God was archetype incarnate, metaphor made man, art become life. Tolkien writes of Christ in almost the same terms. Quote, the gospels contain a fairy story, end quote, or a story of a larger kind, which embraces all the essence of fairy stories. He describes the Gospels as artistic in and of themselves, not in any artificial sense. But, Tolkien adds, this story has entered history in the primary world. The birth of Christ is the eucatastrophe in man's history. To Tolkien, the Gospels contain all the elements of a compelling story, especially the sudden turn to joy at the end, at the brink of doom, when all hope seems lost and Christ suffers on the cross. But this story is not merely compelling, it is true. And because of this, quote, Art has been verified. God is the Lord of angels and of men and of elves. Legend and history have met and fused, end quote. Art has become life. 
Wilde and Tolkien shared a Catholic vision of the world, one that saw matter as enchanted, suffering as a sacrament, and Christ as the ultimate incarnation of beauty. The connection between these famed British authors reveals deeply religious underpinnings of the fantasy genre, a conjecture that may be as heretical as mentioning Wilde and Tolkien in the same breath. Yet the vastly different lifestyles of these two extraordinary men should not detract from the shared vision their work attests to. A fitting analogy for their work is the cathedral, with its ornate spires, stained glass windows, and mathematical precision. Within these structures, objects of everyday life, stone, glass, wood, bread, and wine, are transformed by the magic of art. The walls resound with the music of heaven, and our eyes cannot help but lift upward to the vaulted ceiling adorned with stars. These structures are temples to not only the Holy Trinity, but the Platonic Trinity of truth, goodness, and beauty. And of these three, the Catholic imagination pays homage to beauty most of all. On the surface, Wilde and Tolkien would appear to have disagreed over the meaning of beauty, but their work reveals the extent of their soul's fellowship on the pilgrimage to paradise. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much to both of our presenters. We will now open the floor up for questions.